That's the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2. And I want to begin tonight at the 8th verse, Genesis chapter 2, beginning at the 8th verse. So you're going to be right up real close to the very, 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 very front of your Bible, like within the first 10 or 12 pages probably, or 4 or 5 anyway. Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. Would you stand with me tonight in honor of the reading of God's Word? And the Word of the Lord reads, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Python, which, that is, it, uh, it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, and there is then the bdellium and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittichel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now I want to jump over real quickly to chapter 3. And I just want to read three verses, verses 22 through 24 of chapter 3 in Genesis. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Amen. I want to talk to us tonight on the topic, Knowing the Difference between good and evil. Knowing the difference between good and evil. Master, we thank you tonight for this opportunity once again to hear from your word, to receive from your spirit. God, we ask that this message would be nourishment to the hearer. God, let there be some life, let there be some help, let there be some inspiration in what I have to say to all that might hear this message, both that are here physically, Lord, those that might come uh, and hear our message by tape. We ask God that you'd anoint the Word of God tonight, anoint my lips of clay to deliver it faithfully. Help me, God, today to be your faithful servant, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. You know, there are many within the church world today who seek to elevate themselves by putting down others who are different than themselves labeling them as evil. These same religious zealots make the claim that they have a clear understanding of the definitions and of the differences between good and evil. And if ever there has been a need to understand the nature of good and evil and to define them truthfully, certainly that need exists today. We were reading in our text tonight the context of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. We've all heard the story ever since we were little. I don't think anybody 
Uh, I don't think anybody's not heard the story. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. <laughs> at, at some point in your life, you've understood the story of Adam and Eve and their disobedience to God in the Garden of Eden, which caused them to be placed outside of the Garden, no longer to have access to the Tree of Life. And the interesting thing is that I find when the story is told that a lot of times there is very little emphasis placed on a very important factor. And that factor is that the Bible said that when Satan tempted Eve in the garden, he said that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said, you shall be as God. Well, that was truthful. That was right. What the devil was telling him was only a half-truth. I got news for you. That's how the devil always operates. What he tells you is always a half-truth. There may be a little bit of truth in it, but that doesn't mean that you should bite into the apple. Because Adam and Eve would not be God, but rather Adam and Eve would have the same knowledge that God has of good and evil. They would understand the difference between good and evil. Do you know one of the things today that makes us as human beings able to identify with our Creator is the fact that we're able to differentiate between good and evil. Did you know, Jose, that tonight an elephant doesn't know the difference between good and evil? An elephant acts out of instinct. It does what it does, when it does it, because it feels like it has to. If it tramples somebody to death in the process, it feels no remorse, it feels no guilt, because it doesn't feel that it's done anything wrong. Am I right? Amen. And as the wolf is out in the hunting with his pack, and he kills a rabbit who happens to be the mother rabbit to a bunch of little rabbits that are still back in their little home. That wolf doesn't feel bad that he's killed the mother rabbit who had children who now are going to starve to death because the mother is not there to care for them and keep them warm. No, because animals act out of instinct, but human beings are capable of acting out of knowledge. And to know the difference between good and evil means that we then have the choice to act upon either. Amen? We can either go in the good direction or we can go in the evil direction. If we know the difference, we then have a choice which way are we going to go. I mean, you're going to go this way or that way. There's things of two ways. And tonight, I'm reminded of the fact that God has declared in His Word that Israel at one time was without a priest. So many of His priests had become, uh, had become uh, priests to false gods and had become false prophets. And the Lord said, you know, my people are left without a teaching priest. He said, and there is no one to teach them the difference between good and evil. Because one of the primary functions of the ministry is to help people identify good and evil. Amen. So that we can embrace the good and so that we can uh, abhor the evil and stay as far away from the evil as we can. So tonight I'm doing my job. But the sad part is there are many people who would get up tonight in the pulpit of their churches and they would present things as being evil which in reality do not fit a biblical definition for evil. And they would condemn people, they would call them hopeless, they would call them ungodly, they would call them unrighteous, call them unholy, unclean, whatever you want to call them, because of who they are or what they do, and in reality, who they are or what they do does not fall within the biblical context of evil. So what is evil? Well, prior to the fall, mankind did not know how to differentiate between good and evil. Mankind had no 
knowledge whatsoever that good and evil even existed. Adam and Eve were walking around in something of a spiritual fog. They had no knowledge whatsoever that good and evil were two uh, competing forces that existed within the cosmos and within the universe. The law of God as given to us in the Ten Commandments is probably our best example tonight of a moral compass that helps to define both good and evil. If you look at Exodus 20, uh, verses 1 through 17, I'm not going to read all 17 verses, but I'll give you a synopsis of them. In, chapter, in verse 3, we read the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In verse 4, we read the second commandment, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. In verse 7, we have the third commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. In verse 8, we have the fourth commandment, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In verse 12, the fifth commandment, Honor thy father and thy mother. In verse uh, 13, the sixth commandment, Thou shalt not kill. In verse 14, the seventh commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In verse 15, the eighth commandment, Thou shalt not steal. In verse 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, which is the ninth commandment. And then finally in verse 17, Thou shalt not covet the tenth commandment. You find in the Ten Commandments that the first four commandments are dedicated to man's relationship with his Maker. The first four commandments were, spe were specifically speaking to our relationship with God. And the last six of those commandments, interestingly enough, every one of them, deals with our relationship to our fellow man, our fellow human being. It begins in verse 12, Honor thy father and, father and thy mother, which of course is speaking to our relationship with our parents. And then it says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or his property. All of these commandments are addressing humanity's relationship to humanity and how we interact with other human beings. Romans 7, verses uh, 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul declares, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of conspicuance. For without the law, sin was dead. So if there's no law, then there can't possibly be sin. If you don't have a speed limit, then it's impossible to pull somebody over and say, you're going too fast and you're getting a ticket because you're not allowed to drive that. Well, who said I'm not allowed to drive that fast? Well, I said you're not allowed. Well, who are you? In order, to, in order for a law to be broken, there has to be a law written. The Lord Jesus Christ summed up the entirety of the law by saying in Mark 12, 28 through 31, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
There is none other commandment greater than these. So you see, Jesus Christ just said exactly what I've been saying. The first portion of the commandments, the first four, were encouraging us to love God and to act like we love God. Amen. And the, the last six commandments were teaching us to love our neighbor as ourselves and to act like we love our neighbor as ourselves. Am I telling the truth? Yes, I am. Amen. Getting to understand the nature of good and evil a little bit more clearly. I hope by the end of the evening you'll understand it much more clearly. Matthew 7 and 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Again, Jesus Christ was saying that how you want to be treated, the way that you would like to be treated, is the way that you ought to treat others. He said, this sums up the law, and this sums up the prophets. In John chapter 15 and verse 13, the Lord Jesus Christ made this declaration, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You see, the Lord characterized the difference between good and evil in this way. Mark 3 and 4, And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. You see, evil tonight has its base in destruction. And good has its foundation in construction. Good does not ever seek to harm, injure, kill, or destroy, whereas evil is obsessed with these objectives. You remember the Ten Commandments? We were told in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. All the things that God was telling us in the Ten Commandments that we ought not to do are things that are capable of bringing harm to our neighbor. Amen. Whether it be emotional harm, spiritual harm, financial harm, or physical harm. And God said, I don't want you harming one another. I didn't create you to be running around hurting one another. The nature of evil is to harm and to hurt and to bruise and to destroy. The, the nature of good is to try to be a help and to try to encourage and to try to inspire and to try to help up someone that might be pushed down. When, you know, we talk so much about evil, we hear so much about evil, we hear preachers on television telling us that those individuals who are involved tonight in the homosexual lifestyle, they're evil! It's just evil! Don't you know? Bless God! That's just evil! It's of the devil! It's wrong! The Bible condemns it! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evil has its face in destruction. I do not see two people that care about one another deeply and are devoted to one another and have consecrated themselves to one another and trying to help one another find a better life and have a better life. I'm sorry, but, you know, unless you've got a better definition for evil than I have, I, I don't see where that's evil. Do you? John chapter 10 and verse 10, the Lord Jesus Christ said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. He was speaking of the devil. He was speaking of the enemy. He said, But I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, evil has its foundation in destruction. The thief, the enemy of your soul, his only purpose in, in even entering the room is to steal and to kill and to destroy. And evil, that's where its roots are found tonight, in destruction. 
But when we see human beings doing something constructive and working together in cooperation and acting out of love and harmony, the Bible said, greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friend. You know, Jesus was not merely saying that a person, in order to, to have this level of love, that, this, that you have to die for your friend. That's not necessarily what he was saying. There are a lot of instances in life where people put their own life aside for the sake of their friends. Amen. Your friends need a place to stay. So you, out of love for your friends, you open your home, you make it available to them, and you put your whole life kind of on a back burner for a while because you made a space for them to come in and have a place to live. Amen. That's what the Lord was talking about. He said, greater love hath no man than this. Do you know there are a lot of people in this world, they don't care if you're out there homeless, they don't care if you're out there hungry, they don't care how poor and how broke and how destitute you are. They're not about to open their home to you. They're not about to help you. Amen? But you see, good has its foundation in construction. Good says, well, you know what? I want to try to make this situation better. I want to do what I can do to contribute to making this thing better for this person. Amen. And whether I get anything out of it myself or not, it's not important. I'm just worried. I want to help this person to get up. I want to help them get up higher and attain something better than they have. Amen. Evil could care less. Evil will stand and watch and laugh as someone starts to death in the streets. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. We're trying to understand the nature of evil tonight. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now a lot of people tonight would be surprised, well I don't believe he read that scripture. I thought in this kind of church that they would just kind of avoid that scripture because they wouldn't want to have to deal with it. Honey, I'm not afraid of the Bible. I know what it says. Unfortunately tonight, I think I know what it says a little bit better than what most people understand what it says. I remember one time being in a church and that very scripture was being preached on as I was sitting beside Jason. And I've often teased that Jason was one step away from wearing a tutu and carrying a purse. And that preacher began to go off on a tangent about the effeminate. And how the effeminates were not going to get into heaven. Now, preacher, are you so bloody foolish and stupid and ignorant as to believe that God would condemn men that happen to have feminine characteristics in the way they carry themselves and in the way they, you know, do things? Do you honestly think that's what that is saying? Are you that foolish and ignorant that you believe that that is evil, that for a man to be a feminist is evil. Well, most churches will tell you, yes, by all means, that feminacy is evil. Well, why would it be? You've got a lot of young men that are raised up around women, and that's all they know. That's the only example they've ever had. What are you going to tell me? They're condemned to hell now because they were raised up with a mother and not with a dad? I know men tonight that are married and have children and have families, and they're as feminine as anything I've ever seen. Amen? You know, it's pretty ignorant to try to put effeminacy in a modern definition into the category of evil behaviors. That, that's absurd. It's outrageous. And then if you look a little bit further, if you dig a little bit deeper in the Greek, you find that the term malakos is used, which the King James has translated effeminate. And in reality, malakos 
is of uncertain affinity. They're not altogether sure exactly what it means, but they know that it was used to say that someone or something was soft, that it spoke of fine clothing. Oh, wait a minute. Do you mean to tell me tonight, Brother Morrow, that maybe what Paul was really trying to say was that those who lived a soft existence would not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who wore fine clothing, those who had fancy homes, those who had lots and lots of money, those who didn't want for nothing, that they wouldn't inherit. Well, by heaven, that would only make sense because then that would coincide exactly with what Jesus said, wouldn't it? About a rich man. Come on now, getting into heaven. Said it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom, didn't he? So you see, when you look a little bit deeper, instead of letting the translator use a word and you immediately apply a modern definition to that word, you can't do that. You've got to look back what it meant then. And it meant soft. It meant sumptuous. It meant costly. So those who lived a soft, sumptuous, expensive life, Paul said, were going to be less likely to get into heaven. Actually, he said they wouldn't get in. Amen. That's what he said. Oh, but then, brother, you forget that Paul also said abusers of themselves with mankind. Oh, I'm, I'm well aware of, of the, the fact that he used the term. And again, most preachers tonight will try to tell you this applies to homosexuals, abusers of themselves with mankind. I have, I, I'm curious, though. How in the world does anyone define homosexuality as being abusive? In and of itself, how do you define it as being abusive? And secondly, how do you define it as being abusive? Because if you notice, it doesn't say that they're abusing one another. It says abusers of themselves. They abuse themselves with mankind. If you look at the original Greek, you find out that first of all, let me tell you, let me tell you this. This particular portion of Scripture, the Apostle Paul coupled some words together in such a way that in no other Greek writings throughout the entire New Testament era are these two words found together in this way to describe anything. He literally coined a phrase, is what he did. He, he, he did not have a term to describe what he was trying to say, so he made one up. You know how we might, you might see a, a guy working on a car and he's getting all greasy and all that, and, and you don't know to call him a mechanic, so you call him a grease monkey. You make up a term, you know, you think, you, you make up some, some uh, descriptive term that you feel like describes what he does or what he's doing. And the terms that Paul brought together, that the King James had translated abusers of themselves with mankind, the terms that Paul brought together literally are interpreted lint and couch. Abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, how, how do you get that out of lint couch? But when you do a little bit more research, what you find out is that in the context that Paul is speaking and, and with the inflection that he's placed on it, it appears as though there's a slight sexual connotation involved here. But what Paul apparently seems to be speaking of are individuals who abuse their power and position to take advantage of others sexually 
in exchange for granting them favors, and therefore, if you want this job, well, you got to sleep with me. Lift couch. The idea of what Paul was actually saying was, I'm going to give you a term that's almost identical to lift couch, and you'll understand exactly what I'm saying. What Paul was really saying in a sentence was, casting couch. You've heard of the old saying, casting couch? That's where a young actress, you know, goes into the producer, and she wants to part in the movie, and the producer says, well, sure, I'll give you a part in that movie. Just stretch out on my sofa there, and I'll get sexual with you, and then I'll give you part in my movie. And many actresses and actors over the years have been accused of, oh, they got where they got because of the casting, uh, the, because of the casting couch. Because they slept their way up the ladder. That's how they got all the parts they got. That's how they got all the movies they got. And that's what Paul was talking about. But he wasn't talking about the people who were being taken advantage of. He was talking about the fools who were taking advantage of others. And who were abusing their own bodies sexually by giving it and using it for, for every sexual pleasure they could possibly lay their hand on because people needed something from them. And there was a common practice in biblical times, the New Testament times. There was a very common practice where priests from various religions used to offer their blessing to their parishioners. You know, I'll bless your flocks, and I'll bless your crops, and I'll bless your family, and I'll bless your house, and I'll bless this, and I'll bless that. And all you have to do is sleep with me. Male and female, didn't matter. All you have to do is, is perform this little perver perverted sexual act on me. You see, when you don't realize that these things went on in biblical times, then you don't understand what Paul was talking about. Well, Paul knew what he was talking about, but he didn't know how to describe it. He didn't know how to exactly say people who use their position, whether it's a religious position. Oh, my, wait a minute. Do we know anything? I wonder, does anybody know anything about any priests nowadays that use their position to take advantage of sexually take advantage of others? Well, gee, there's only been about a dozen cases in the news recently a Roman Catholic priest hung. And a lot of these, you hear the young men come out of the situation and they'll tell you, well, the priest told me that if I would do this, that God would bless me. They use their position in order to take advantage of some poor soul who needed something and they took advantage of them. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? And that is what the scripture is talking about. And this is what Paul was saying. He was saying, not that effeminate, meaning men who are somewhat on the effeminate side. That's not what he meant. But he said, those who have a soft life, those who have a sumptuous life, a luxurious life, the rich. He said, and those who take advantage of others in their need in order to satisfy themselves sexually and use their own body sexually and in order to get what they want and in order to, uh, it's important they'll do anything to help another human being, they've got to get, and y'all have heard me tell you, I was in Atlanta for six months, and while I was in Atlanta, I guarantee you, I didn't know anybody there that would help me do anything except they got something in return sexually. It was just exactly what the scriptures was talking about here in 2 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. So you see tonight, we see that it's much more likely that this passage speaks of those who take advantage of and abuse others sexually, who are in need of help or assistance from the stronger, wealthier, more connected of the two. First Corinthians 6.18 tells us, flee fornication. 
every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What is the more realistic and likely proper interpretation of these terms that we've read about, that we've spoken about? Wealthy, greedy, those who use their status and wealth to take advantage of others, they're not going to make it into the kingdom of God. That's what Paul said. It's that simple. Because evil has its foundation in destruction. Amen. And if we're going to understand the nature of evil, we've got to understand tonight that when you can take advantage of someone sexually or otherwise in order to achieve your end, and you're, you're not willing to help another human being until they've given themselves to you physically. Do you realize what these people are doing? Do you know what these priests have done to these young boys for the emotionally for the rest of their lives? They're ruined. In Matthew 19:24, Mark 10:25, and Luke 18:25, all three places. Jesus said, and again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now doesn't it make sense tonight that Paul would have been speaking about rich individuals and people who use their wealth and power and status? Doesn't it make a whole lot better sense? That that is what Paul was speaking of, then all of a sudden out of the clear blue sky he was talking supposedly about homosexuality. Can anyone be so foolish as to believe that God would condemn an individual, label them as evil, simply because they do not have a macho personality? That's pretty goofy, isn't it? Think about it. Can you imagine God's going to condemn somebody just because they're not macho? Well, you're too sissy for me. Look at the description of some of our greatest biblical heroes. David, in 1 Samuel 16, 12, and he sent and brought him in. Now he, David, that is, was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. Look at the description of Daniel found in Daniel chapter 1, uh, verses 3 and 4, as well as verse 9. And the king said, spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. But now listen to this now. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Daniel must have been something to look at because the king sent his eunuch out to find all the best looking men out of the children of Israel who had brains, he wanted, in other words, he wanted the cream of the crop. He wanted the best they got. He said, I want the best look and I want, he said, without a blemish. I don't want a blemish on him. I want perfect guys. Now, why in the world would he pick this eunuch to do that? Take a wild guess. And then look what happened. Out of all the men that the eunuch picked, it says, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuch. And if you go back and you look in the Hebrew, guess what you find out? Do you know what that verse literally means? It means that this eunuch fell in love with Daniel. And God used the eunuch's love for Daniel. Because it was the eunuch's love for Daniel that motivated him to go against the wishes of the king and to secretly bring a different diet in to Daniel and his friends. When he knew that if the king knew that these men were asking for a different diet, that the king would have them all killed. How dare you? I bring you into my house. I bring you into my... 
I'll bring you into my home, and I'm willing to train you up, you know, and to teach you all the greatest things that, that are known to our kingdom, and, and feed you the finest food, and you have the audacity to tell me that you'll only eat kosher. And the eunuch knew that these men's lives were at stake, and yet, because he was in love with Daniel, he was willing to bring Daniel in secretly, a diet that was kosher, so that they didn't have to break their law as Jews and eat that which they believed to be unclean. So you see, God even used that gay man to achieve his end. Hmm, interesting. But you see, there's nothing destructive about the nature of this man's love for Daniel. How did this man's love for Daniel, how did it play out? How did it act out? It acted out constructively, didn't it? If you look at the story, it saved, their, it saved them from having to break their, their law, their dietary law, and it preserved their lives. When we understand tonight the true nature of good and evil, it suddenly becomes obvious that God is pleased when human beings love and work in cooperation one with another to better their quality of life and range of experience. The Lord said it plainly that He had come to give us life more abundant, a better quality of life, unlike the thief who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The first law of God involves loving our neighbor as ourselves, which implies that we must first love ourselves. Good has its foundation in knowing and loving our Creator. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 18. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. So you see, all good has its foundation in God, and that's why the first commandment is to love God. Because if you love God, you're going to love good. Amen? The very next level in this structure, however, involves loving ourselves. We must learn to see ourselves as the property and possession of God, and as such, see the value in ourselves. We do have worth. Our bodies are not to be used as a bargaining chip, carelessly offered to all comers for the purpose of achievement or financial gain, but rather it is to be honored as a temple or a dwelling place of the Holy Ghost. As the dwelling place of God's Spirit, we ought to live like Christ, using our physical bodies and earthly existence to do good and to be a blessing to the world in which we live. Acts 10 and 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. When you've got God with you in your life, you're going to do good. Amen? You're going to be constructive. You're going to try to help people up. You're going to try to give them a leg up. We are admonished by, the, by apostolic epistle, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, for we must all appear <clears throat> before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Galatians 6, 9, and 10. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have opportunity, therefore, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Hebrews 12 tells us in verse 14, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Galatians 6 and 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. The difference between good and evil tonight, my friend, is not what churches tell you is good and what they tell you is evil. If what they tell you is evil cannot pass the litmus test of Scripture, if what they tell you is evil does not pass a biblical definition of evil, then it's not evil. Evil is destructive. Evil is opportunistic. Evil is 